Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the launch of the International Energy Agency's World Energy Investment Outlook. It is a pleasure for me to introduce to you today our speakers. Uh, to my left, Maria Vanderhoven, the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, and Dr. Fatih Birol, the Chief Economist of the International Energy Agency. Maria Vanderhoven will make some introductory remarks about the report key findings, and Dr. Birol will then walk you through the detailed findings. After that, we will take your questions. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us today for the launch of this special report, the World Energy Investment Outlook. Well, the presentation of the annual World Energy Outlook in November has already become a regular fixture in the energy cal calendar, and I invite you to note the 12th of November in your diaries. It will be here, isn't it? In the same, same venue. And that's the date when we shall present our full updated outlook later this year. We will also be launching a special regional focus on the energy outlook for Africa, and that will be in London on the 13th of October. But as part of the expanding World Energy Outlook series, this is the fourth year in a row that we meet also in the spring to present additional an analysis, and this time it's on investment. Now, why put the spotlight on investment? The answer is very simple. Because many of our hopes and our worries about the future of the global energy system boil down to questions about money, about investment. Will policies and market conditions create enough investment opportunities in the regions and sectors where they are needed? Will financing be available so that investors can take up these opportunities? And will policymakers succeed in steering investments towards a cleaner, more secure energy system? Or are we locking in technologies and patterns of consumption that store up trouble for the future? Now, the total requirement for energy investment emerging from this anal analysis is, is huge. More than $40 trillion in energy supply over the period to 2035 in our main scenario, alongside an additional $8 trillion of investment in energy efficiency, of which 90% is in transport and building sectors. And of the $40 trillion in energy supply, more than half, more than half is required just to keep the energy system producing at today's levels. Or in other words, to compensate for declining output from existing oil and gas fields, to replace power plants that are retired, or to replace equipment that reaches the end of its operational life. In geographical terms, nearly two-thirds of the energy supply investment takes place in emerging economies, although Aging infrastructure and climate policies mean a large investment requirement also across OECD countries. Now, you know, for most of us, dealing in trillions of dollars is not an easy task. Sums of money are comprehensible only on a, on a smaller scale. So alongside the global numbers, we narrow our focus in the report on some critical components of the global energy system, where the investments required are measured only in billions. But the effects are nonetheless directly felt by consumers. Just an example, LNG. LNG, where there are expectations in some places that new supplies from the United States can transform gas markets by exporting not just US gas, but also by exporting US natural gas prices. And those are a fraction of those in Europe or in Asian markets. And LNG, from the US and elsewhere, indeed plays a very important role in our outlook for gas markets. But it's worth remembering that moving gas over long distances is expensive, up to 10 times higher than moving an equivalent amount of coal or oil around the world. So understanding the scale of this investment in new liquef liquefaction facilities and LNG tankers and what this means for the costs of delivering LNG should help to provide a realistic assessment of the price at which future LNG will be available. We also focus on areas where we feel that there is a risk of investment falling short of what is required. We look at the Middle East, where increased investment remains absolutely critical to the longer-term outlook for oil markets, once the current surge 
a non-OPEC production starts to plateau in the 2020s. If investment doesn't pick up as needed, this will mean much tighter and more volatile oil markets. And in the 2020s, we expect then higher prices. We look at India, where electricity production has doubled since 2000, but still lags behind demand and where the incentives for investments are dimmed by low end-user tariffs and high losses in the transmission and distribution network. We look in detail at the current problems in Europe, where the design of power markets raises serious doubts about the business case for new investment in thermal capacity. Alongside the continued expansion of renewables, the base load and balancing provided by this fossil fuel generation is essential to maintain the reliability of Europe's electricity system. So the question is how to ensure the lights don't go off, how to diminish risks of blackouts. But even if all the investment projected in our main world energy outlook scenario comes forward on time, this would not mean that the problems of the energy sector are solved. Today's energy policies and policy ambitions are not adequate to tackle some of the most critical challenges facing the energy sector. Almost one billion people are left without access to electricity in this scenario in 2035. And the investment required to close this failure in the global energy system doesn't materialize. And this is a topic which we, to which we will return in detail in the Rio analysis of Africa later this year. And in addition, today's policies and market signals are simply not strong enough to meet the world's climate change target. Getting the world onto a path consistent with a two-degree climate objective is, 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 a, is a very steep hill to climb. At just under $40 trillion, the amount needed for energy supply is quite similar to our main scenario, but the composition is quite different. And there is a much larger requirement of $14 trillion for investment in energy efficiency. Now, the switch in investment towards low-carbon sources and energy efficiency brings new types new types of investors into the picture in a much larger way. Municipalities, small businesses, households. And this will require innovative models both for investment and for financing. So what lessons can be drawn? Governments are ever more active in shaping energy markets and investment decisions. They are motivated by, by a range of policy concerns and by increasing <coughs> public awareness on a range of energy and environmental issues. But the key message is that <coughs> investment and finance are very responsive to the quality of this policy making. So clear and credible signals from policy makers lower risks and inspire confidence. But by contrast, where there is a record of policy incoherence, confusing signals or stop and go policy cycles, investors end up paying more for their finance, consumers pay more for their energy, and some projects that are, that are needed simply won't go ahead. So we should be very wary of the risk of shortfalls in investments and the knock-on effects on regional and global energy security, as well as of the risk that investments are misdirected because of environmental impacts are not being properly reflected in prices. So with these thoughts, and without further delay, I would like to turn the floor over to <coughs> Fatih Birol, Chief Economist of the IEA. He directed the report and he is going to present the detailed findings. Thank you, Fatih.